This video is brought to you by Atlas VPN. Hello number one, so welcome back to my channel, this is the Metatron speaking and as the most perceptive among you might have noticed, I have somewhat of a passion for the classical era and just like with every other historical period discussed on this platform, I think the most important aspects of talking about history are sticking to the facts and to avoid bending, changing, misquoting or misrepresenting historical events. And we can all agree that that would be the perfect approach, I mean at the end of the day facts are facts, the truth is not an opinion, at least in a utopic reality, but unfortunately we know that there are people out there that choose to look at history through the prism or lenses of their own ideologies and also choose to misrepresent not only historical events but entire cultures and people, say for example ancient Greece, in order to be able to push their own ideologies backing them up historically. This is the case, for instance, of this page, far from being the only one, which is clearly trying to use the framework of Greek-Roman civilization as a historical example of a gay social paradise. Obviously, this is done with the intent of normalizing same-sex relationships in the mind of modern people, but it's far from being the professionally conducted comprehensive analysis that you would need to do that. This is biased, incompetent, shoddy work. Now before I start dismantling this article, I'd like to give a small disclaimer that I've always been the kind of guy with the following position. You do whatever you want in your own privacy as long as it's consenting adults who actually cares. I've always been against bullying and I'm a subscriber of the pizza principle. I like margarita, you like pepperoni pizza. As long as I don't try to force you to like margarita and you don't try to force me to like pepperoni pizza, to each his own. As long as the pizza's fully cooked, no problem. Therefore, the only problem I have with this, which is an insurmountable one, is that the people who write these articles do so in open rebellion against documented reality. Now, whether you agree with this normalization or not, it's beyond the point. Regardless of your ideas, ideology and position in the political spectrum, whether you are a part of LGBTQ plus or not, this is not the right way to do it. In fact, if you are LGBTQ and watching, what I'm about to read should piss you off. Your quest for historical representation should be satisfied on the balance of probabilities based on unbiased evidence. Not this. And I'll show you why. So, here's the burning question for today. Was ancient Greece an LGBTQ plus paradise where same-sex relationships were not just tolerated but in fact encouraged and regarded as the highest form of love superior even to heterosexual ones and fully accepted by everyone at a societal level. Well, let's see how this page answers that. Homosexuality or same-sex attraction and relationships has been present in human societies for thousands of years. Well, we absolutely agree on that. <laughs> Don't expect that to happen again though today. In ancient Greece, homosexuality was a common and accepted part of society and was seen as a natural expression of love and desire. Okay, how such a small paragraph can be wrong on so many levels is beyond me. I'll get back to that. This acceptance of homosexuality was reflected in various aspects of Greek culture, including art, literature and religion. In ancient Greek art, homosexuality was also commonly depicted. Many Greek sculptures and paintings show men in romantic or sexual relationships with other men. These works of art were not seen as scandalous or shocking, but rather as beautiful and natural expressions of love and desire. And of course, no evidence presented, no links, just statements. I'm supposed to believe their words. Well, here's a little psychology fact for you. Each time someone repeats their lie, they will feel more confident in what they are saying. Of course, this person is not going to show us the evidence to support words such as very common and many, when they know that such evidence will not support what they are saying and in fact ultimately dismantle their lie. I'll do that for you. Usually, when you talk about ancient Greek art representing erotic encounters between males, this predominantly consists of vases. Now, about 80,000 pottery pieces have been examined, and according to Dover, the author of the book Greek Homosexuality, published in 1978, which tends to be the basis of such statements, of these 80,000 pieces, only about 600, not even 1%, contain what could be considered homosexual scenes. Now, what Dover doesn't tell you in his book is that when you actually go and see this famous 600, only 30 maybe represent homosexual scenes, the other 570 complete wishful thinking. And there is a reason why I'm placing maybe even for those remaining 30. First, because some of those 30 include non-humans, such as satyrs or satyrs, who shouldn't really count, since they were considered, as by the words of Pliny the Elder, 
as being wild, horrible, hideous, perverted tricksters. So not the best representative of tolerance and acceptance of homosexuality at a societal scale. Not to mention most of the time satyrs wanted women anyways. Reason number two, out of all these 30 scenes, Dover considered some of the heterosexual sex scenes as being gay. Why? Well, I can't show the scene, but the reason is because of the position chosen. So the guy chooses this position with a woman, then probably actually wanted another guy. He also thinks that this is a scene representing gay love. A guy with a sword who's about to stab the other guy, so of course this means he wants to have sex with him, right? So, if we use common sense and we remove all the ones that are really a stretch of a stretch, then we are left with a real number of vases depicting actual homosexual intercourse. A whopping 0.000375%. That's not even 0.4%. Now, how that qualifies as commonly depicted and many is beyond me. This acceptance of homosexuality was reflected in various aspects of Greek culture, including art, literature and religion. We briefly mentioned art, let's talk literature. There are indeed many sources of evidence that we could discuss. Lyrical poetry, myths, philosophical treatises, speeches, inscriptions, medical texts, tragedies, comedies, curses and anecdotes, where homosexuality is either ignored or condemned. But you're not going to mention those, are you? Because they don't support the picture that you're trying to paint. And therefore, you're literally silencing the words of the ancients that disagree with your ideology. And that's intellectually dishonest, not only towards the ancient, but also towards the people that are believing in your words and didn't have the time to go check the original documents. And of course, I don't just ask you to believe me, I'll show you the evidence, but now let's keep reading. Now, if you're like me and you like to surf the internet looking for interesting historical information, it's a great idea to do it in safety, which is why you should totally use today's sponsor, Atlas VPN. A VPN is a virtual private network that makes all of your internet traffic travel through an encrypted tunnel, and this way it protects you from spying, public Wi-Fi dangers, it hides your IP address and online activities. Atlas VPN is a great choice because it was developed by cyber security specialists, and among other things, it gives you access to the data breach monitor, which is a security feature designed to track any data breaches related to your online account, automatically scanning any leaked information. But another add-on through Atlas VPN is the fact that you can use Netflix from any countries regardless of where you are. So let's say that you wanted to watch a show that is only available in the UK but you live in America. No problem, just change your country through the VPN and boom, access granted. I always have Atlas VPN active on my machines and that is because one account lets you use multiple devices. I personally really like Atlas VPN not only because it's a great choice but also because it's really affordable and that links to today's special offer. So grab the big deal. Atlas VPN Premium is just $1.99 per month with a 30 days money back guarantee. So if you've been considering getting a VPN but you weren't sure about the prices then now is the time. And don't forget to click the link in the description. That's $1.99 a month with a 30 days money back guarantee. Keep in mind that this is a time limited offer so be quick and click the link in the description. And big thanks to Atlas VPN for sponsoring my video. One of the most famous examples of homosexuality in ancient Greece is the story of Achilles and Patroclus. In Greek mythology, Achilles and Patroclus were two warriors who were close friends and companions. Many scholars believe that their relationship was more than just platonic and that they were, in fact, lovers. First of all, remove many scholars and replace with many activists. And only some scholars. See, differently from this person, I've actually read the original text. In the original story, as many of you who have watched the film Troy will already know, Achilles and Patroclus are described as friends. Patroclus is Achilles' friend. In the story Achilles did have sex with many women but never with a man. Okay, so if in the original story there's no mention of any sexual relationship between Achilles and Patroclus and they're only mentioned as friends, then what do they base this statement on? Because when Patroclus died, Achilles was upset. Okay. So, you're watching. Let's say you are a guy and you have a guy best friend. You were brought up together, you're very close, you have a very strong connection. Your friend dies, maybe there is an accident. If that upsets you, it means you're gay. This is the logic. 
Now, if this video worked just like that article, I would leave it at that and I would not tell you that actually this idea of Patroclus and Achilles being gay lovers is not modern. It might be an idea that has been pushed by activists, but it's not an idea born from activists. In fact, it's ancient. And Miller, the author of the famous book Song of Achilles, definitely decides to go for the gay lover route. So to the person who wrote this article, let me show you how you present evidence from both sides and then let your audience decide and make their own mind. Let me show you how it's done. To give you precise context, what we're talking about is the Iliad. The Iliad was written by Homer. Homer lived in the 8th century BC, hence archaic Greece. In the original text, Homer gives us zero mentions of Achilles and Patroclus being lovers. Nothing. And yet, even in academia, there are people that think that they were lovers and people that don't. With the likes of Gregory Nagy and Robin Lane Fox, some of the most influential and knowledgeable historians of ancient Greece, saying that they don't think that these two characters were in love. But as Miller herself tells us, the reason why she chose to go for the gay lover's route is because of the words of Plato. So in other words, Plato did think that Achille and Patroclus were lovers. Here is the problem with that. Plato was a 5th century philosopher and writer. So as you can see, there is already three centuries of distance between him and the actual author of the Iliad. If they were lovers, then from the Greek point of view of the 5th century, it would have meant pederasty. And yet we have no evidence that pederasty was a thing at all in the 8th century when the Iliad was written. Okay, but still, an ancient Greek thought they were lovers, so I want to side with Plato. And that's absolutely okay. But the thing they don't tell you is that there is another author, Cecilphone, who completely disagreed with Plato and thought instead, and specifically said, that both Achilles and Patroclus were not in a relationship. And both Plato and Cecilphone were decided of Socrates. So it's not right that they only mention the one they agree on and completely silence or ignore the one that they don't agree with. Also because Sisophon was not just a guy, it was an Athenian-born military leader, philosopher and historian. And however you look at it, it's checkmate. If they choose to ignore him, then they are silencing him. They could of course tell us, nah, it's because he was a homophobe. Even if that were the case, if he was a homophobe, then that would contradict the idea or notion that 5th century Greece was a gay paradise if someone so prominent was a homophobe. My personal take is that they loved each other as brothers. If you disagree, that's fine, but it's important to present all the facts. Using this approach to try and identify LGBTQ ideology through historical evidence, we cannot and should not try and project and overimpose modern identity concepts, classifications and even nomenclature onto the minds of ancient people. In other words, as we will see on this video, being gay in 2023 is not the same as being gay in the 5th century BC in Athens. And how could it be? So in reality, I would avoid even attaching the word LGBTQ plus to the ancient world, because this word is too connected to modern filters, and it comes loaded with its own baggage of interpretations and expectations thereof. Not to mention that whenever this person says ancient Greece, they are trying to install this false concept of all the Greeks everywhere in Greece thought the same thing, thought the same way, whereas we know that different cities had different legal and societal positions towards such practices. And of course, these are not cities of a nation in the modern sense, these are city-states, single district units of political organization. The enforcement of morals in classical city-states differed monumentally between them. Some allowed it, some ignored it, some were ambiguous about it, and some completely prohibited it. And when we say it, we can't even specifically mean homosexuality or same-sex attraction and relationship. Same-sex relationships in a broad sense, because these dynamics are in fact very difficult to navigate when it comes to the classical world. One, we have no documented evidence to assess the overall attitude of ancient Greek society towards woman-to-woman -to -woman attraction. After all, ancient Greece was a very male-centric society. It is unclear how such relationships between same-sex partners were regarded in the general society, especially for women. Oxford Classical Dictionary, Entry on Homosexuality, pages 720 to 723. But what about the Greek poetry Sappho Metatron? Oh yeah, I'll talk about it too. I'll talk about everything today. The majority of what you read that may imply, focus on the may, a sexual relationship between males has to do with pederasty or pederasty. So a grown man with an adolescent boy, sometimes as young as 12. Quote, the age limit for pederasty in ancient Greece seems to encompass, at the minimum end, boys of 12 years of age. To love a boy below the age of 12 was considered inappropriate. Thank the gods. After having read this, do you still want to attach the word beautiful and natural to it? 
Well, let me tell you, the only way you could do that if you added the infamous P at the end of LGBTQ+, which I know you guys don't want to. Definitely wasn't a paradise for the kids, underaged, often non-consensual boys. If anything, when pederasty did involve sexual relationship, which wasn't always the case, it would have resulted in PTSD for the boy. Not something I'd call, open quotes, beautiful and natural expression of love and desire. But you know, the older man would give them gifts, so uh, yeah, still no. Adult to adult, man to man relationships where two equal partners love each other and perhaps even want to get married and share their lives of love together were not accepted at a societal level in ancient Greece. And whenever we see mentions of it, very seldomly mind you, they were often disdained or mocked. There is also the whole aspect of active passive polarization in the sense that the two males were not considered equal among them. There was a dominant and a submissive role and in the case of the submissive one it was associated with lower status. So whenever in these articles they mention ancient Greece, so they're saying in ancient Greece this, in ancient Greece that, they are presenting a very flat Greece devoid of the cultural and spatial depth, the city-states we have just mentioned, but also temporal depth, no mention of the eight ages. So what, we are supposed to believe that the Greeks did not change their mind once in the entirety of all the city-states throughout the entirety of their history when it comes to homosexual relationships? Goodness gracious, you just found the most homogenous human civilization on the planet. Well, person who wrote this article, here's your reality check. During this extremely lengthy space of time, ancient Greece changed its ideals, social conventions, positions, mindsets, governing bodies and opinions of the citizens as well as the educated elite. History is a flux, not a flatboard, onto which you can project your own modern ideals. To briefly jump back into literature before moving into religion and starting to talk about the gods, oftentimes Plato is mentioned when trying to bring up this idea that to the ancient Greeks, men-to-men -men love was the highest form of love. Well, first of all, that's the opinion of Plato. And the opinion of one person doesn't necessarily reflect the opinion of the entirety of the country. I mean, <laughs> Americans know a thing or two about that. Second, if we look at why he thinks so, is because he thinks that male-to-male -male relationships have a sort of formative educational structure to them as well. Which means that he's specifically talking about, once again, pederasty. The mentor and the pupil. He's not talking about two 40-year-old guys that want to get married. Third, this is probably the most laughable thing of all of these, no one mentions the fact that Plato actually changed his mind completely towards the end of his career. So when you read his later writings, 360. They don't say that. I think that's something you do need to mention if you want to use Plato's words. Otherwise it becomes cherry-picking. There you go. Now, this brings up the elephant in the room that I've mentioned a few times, pederasty. A couple more things to say about that. So, when you read period authors, pederasty was not and did not always involve sex. In fact, according to several authors, it wasn't supposed to. It was supposed to be an educational relationship, a mentor-pupil relationship. But of course, some wealthy, powerful and well-connected men took advantage of that. Well, Metron, that's a bold statement. If that were the case, wouldn't classical authors tell us about it? Yes. They did. Herodotus, Plato, Xenophon and Athenaeus, among others. In his symposium, Plato tells us that parents would hire bodyguards to protect their children from old men. We are also told that other children would often mock another youth caught up in a pederastic relationship. Why would they mock them if it was accepted? Since I was mentioning that Plato changed his mind, here are his words. He tells us that pederasty is both shameful and honourable at the same time. It says that when someone is unable to control his lust, it brings shame to him because he's bringing shame on another citizen. We know that all the Stoics were against promiscuity and that they were against homosexual activity. For them, they were not real relationships. Xenophon tells us that physical contact between teacher and students was simply unacceptable. And when pederasty went sexual, we are told that it meant to be given to unnatural lust. From Plato laws, sexual pleasure is held to have been granted by nature to male and female when conjoined for the work of procreation. The crime of male with male or female with female is an outrage of nature and a capital surrender to lust of pleasure. Plato tells us that it's lust towards boys inciting and renewing the desire it gratifies. 
Aristotle tells us there are brutish characteristics and other such characteristics arise through illness as well as through madness in some cases, like the man who made a sacrifice of his mother and ate her, and in addition to these, the pleasure of sex with males. The ancient Roman Claudius Aelianus tells us in Varia Historia, Spartan love had nothing base because neither the boy dared to accept lewdness nor the lover dared to be lewd, since it was no good for any of them to dishonor Sparta. If this ever happened, they were either exiled or, what was worse, killed. Plato laws, no one should dare have sex with the brave and free by their own wife, nor should be allowed to have illegitimate offsprings by concubines or childless, and unnatural intercourse with men. Even better, sexual intercourse between men should be once and for all prohibited. When it comes to religion, the situation becomes even sillier. Let's look at the gods. Aphrodite has a husband and many men lovers. Athena is chaste. Aris has a wife. Zeus has a wife, Hera, although he also goes around and basically has sex with as many human females as he possibly can. I love it how some activists even bring up the story of Cyproitus, the man who allegedly saw Artemis, the goddess of hunt, naked in the woods and then is turned into a woman and they say that that's a representation of modern-day transgender. And of course, they leave out the fact that he was turned into a woman as a punishment for having seen the goddess naked. They're not gonna tell you that. Poseidon fell in love for a nymph, had his head Persephone, Eros and Psyche, and I can go on. Another incorrect notion is this connection that they constantly make in this article between love and desire. You see, even though in the modern era we do tend to connect sexual desire and love as one whole beautiful thing, in ancient Greece that wasn't the case, and associating love and desire and putting them together is historically incorrect. The Greeks didn't put them together. In fact, they divided them even in the realm of the 12 Olympians and the gods in general. Aphrodite was the goddess of love and beauty. Eros was the god of desire. And oftentimes in the minds of the ancient Greeks, sexual desire was something that needed to be controlled, and if you lost control, it was shameful. But as you noticed earlier on the video, I mentioned medical texts. Well, this is the smoking G-U-N of this video. Get ready. Several physicians of the time, and we have all of this documented, tried to explain why people were homosexual. Some said that they act contrary to their nature. Others say it's a disease. Others consider it to be a mental illness. Others say it's even a birth defect. Do I agree with any of these? No, I don't. But does that mean that I'm not gonna mention them? No, because that would be being intellectually dishonest, which is precisely what they are being writing these articles, ignoring completely every single word written by physicians of the time, who were also ancient Greeks. So, however you want to see it, considering ancient Greek as the LGBTQ paradise is very much of a myth. That doesn't mean that homosexuality wasn't a thing, of course it existed, but it wasn't considered as the highest form of love encouraged by all ancient Greeks. The same. This is such a simplistic two-dimensional and, after all, incorrect statement within a three-dimensional, extremely deep topic that it really disrespects the Greeks. In ancient Greece, just like today, there were people that were against it, there were people that ignored it, and there were people that were in favor of it. Humans are humans, and the idea of projecting modern ideologies into the ancients and try to read the myths, not from the perspective of their minds after an accurate and deep dive study and research about their culture, but instead completely ignoring their culture forcing them our ideas and silencing anyone who disagrees with you, this kind of approach is a disgrace. As I was saying, the only hint of lesbianism is the eponymic lesbos of Sappho. The poems, however, are very few. And the conclusion you draw as reading it is that it's not 100% certain that that poem are from the point of view of Sappho, the author, or if it's the words of a character who would be a man. Also, Sappho had a husband. That doesn't automatically mean that she wasn't a lesbian, but it's, once again, another stretch. All right, Noble Ones, but I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please remember, thumbs up, and if you're not yet members of this community, become a Noble One. Subscribe to my channel for more content from the Metatron. Don't forget to click the link in the description below to take advantage of the amazing offer by Atlas VPN. Thank you very much for watching, and remember, the Metatron has spread his wings. Goodbye.